And now, ladies and gentlemen, Ralph Emery. Yes. Hello, everybody from Nashville. My name is Ralph Emery, and we are here live with a man I have known for about 50 years. I want to welcome the thin man from West Plains, Missouri, Porter Wagoner. Thank you, Ralph. Howdy, buddy. How are you? Nice to see you, Porter. Thank you very much. I have really looked forward to your being on this show. Well, I am look forward to it, too. I'd love to be with you. You know, on this network, RFD, they still show the Porter Wagoner show. Yes. Let's talk about that. Well, that's the show that I did uh, several years ago, and uh, you know what? It still looks good. That show started in 1960, I believe. It did, yes. Yeah. How did how did they happen to pick you? Well, they were wa looking at uh, acts that was on the Grand Ole Opry at that time. Bill, uh, uh, the guy that uh, at showbiz. Yes. Uh, uh, and Bill, he. Bill Graham. Bill Graham was a brilliant man, I, I felt like, and uh, he uh, came out, met me in the alley one night out behind the opera house and introduced himself, and he said, I've been looking at you on the Grand Ole Opry, been watching you for a few weeks, and said, I, I kind of like your act, I like what you're about, and he said, I think you could really sell product, and what do you think about doing a television show? And that really kind of sent me in a state of shock. I said, well, I hadn't been thinking about it because I, I didn't have no idea of doing one right now. And he, and he just proceeded to tell me that he was going to audition people the following week. And uh, he mentioned some of the acts that he was going to audition was uh, uh, people all from the Grand Ole Opry. And I went out and did an audition for him on Monday. And... Uh, from what I understand, he didn't audition nobody else. He just liked me, and he hired me right on the spot. Now, at this point, you've got to put together a show. Yes. And uh, I read that you uh, you followed the designs that Roy Acuff had put in his band. I did. I, t I told him that I'd, uh, I'd like to have a show with a comedian, and I'd like to have a girl singer, and... Uh, he said that'd be no problem at all. He would want that too, and uh, so I had a, an idea about uh, Norma Jean. I had met her, had been on tour with her, and uh, I, she was hired for the first first uh, uh, year, and uh, uh, it just he wanted me to hire the people that I wanted to have on the show, and uh, I decided to hire Speck. Speck Rhodes. Yeah. Because Speck had a lot of material and was really a funny guy, I thought, and uh, I, I liked him as a person very well. He's the guy that talks to Sadie on the telephone. Yes, and uh, he really fit in well with, this, with the show. He was just a super guy to work with, too, and I had seen him when I was a little boy at, uh, at my hometown, West Plains, Missouri. How, how long did uh, Norma Jean stay with you? Well, she stayed till Dolly came on the show, which was uh, 1973, I believe, or somewhere in there. You sure it wasn't about 1967? Uh, 67. Now, I'm not, now, no, I'm not sure at all. That, uh, <laughs> Porter, I want you to watch the screen for right. a living piece of history. All right. Right now, I want you to meet the little lady on our show. You know, Miss Norma Jean, that's been with us for many, many years, had to leave our show because we work so much on the road and do so many TV shows to kind of have a little time at home for our personal life. And I looked at a long time and thought of many, many folks that uh, we all liked and thought that you would like. And here's a little gal that I know you're going to really learn to love because she's a fine singer and one of the finest little gals that I've ever met. Let's give her a great big welcome as she sings a song that she had a big hit on called Dumb Blonde. She ain't no dumb blonde, though. Pretty Miss Dolly Parton. How about it? Don't try to cry. You're way out of this. Don't try to cry. Remember that, Porter? 
Yeah. That's I'd... a little surprise we cooked up. Wow, that's that's nice. Actually, we th we're thankful to Jim Owens who who he dug around his his uh, library and found that for us. That's great. Yeah, I'm glad you did. I hadn't seen that in, since we'd done it, I guess. But that's that was when you made the swap, the yeah. change from yeah. Norma Jean to Dolly. Yeah. How did Dolly get that job? How did you find her? Well, uh, I held auditions at my office. Uh, I was in the RCA building that then. And uh, I had several girls come by and audition for the job. And I really liked Dolly very well because she was uh, so different than Norma Jean was the, one of the things I liked about her. And uh, she also was a great writer. I liked the songs she had written. She brought a bunch of them with her. And uh, I just, uh, she sold me on herself the first day she was there. And uh, I uh, just almost hired her on the spot. I told her she had the job, you know as far as I was concerned, unless I changed my mind. But had, you, had you seen her work before she came to no, see you? No, I hadn't. I had never never seen her act before. And uh, she had been in town for a little while with uh, Fred uh, Foster had a record label, Monument. Yes. And uh, of course, I wanted her to be on RCA Victor so I could record with her, whoever I hired. And uh, I uh, really liked her singing, too, and I could sang with her pretty well, I felt like, and uh, we talked about that too, and uh, I just, she was just, boy, knocked me out as a singer, and, uh, and her songwriting especially. But everything didn't go according to your plan at first, because Dolly told me that the first time she went on the road with you in Louisiana, she got booed. Well, actually it was in Virginia. Oh, was it? Yeah, and uh, she did get booed, yeah. Because the, one of the reasons for it was she talked so fast they couldn't understand what she was saying. And another reason was they was wanting to see Norma Jean. And, uh, of course, Norma wasn't there and wasn't going to be there anymore with my show. And uh, I tried to explain that when I introduced Dolly. But uh, it really broke, was heartbreaking for her, and it really... Uh, it, but it, you did a very smart thing. Well, you uh, you went you, in the succeeding shows. You decided to sing with Dolly. Yeah, I and told that, her that, that night. That made the crowd accept her. Yeah, it did. I told her on the way to Pennsylvania. We was going from Virginia to Pennsylvania. I said, "What we've got to do tonight uh, is we need to stay up and and learn a couple of songs, a couple of duets we can sing together." And I started asking her about songs and. The, but she first said, I know blue eyes crying in the ring. I said, we don't want a ballad, Dolly. <laughs> we want, need some up-tempo. And uh, she said, well, I, I think I know this song the Glazer Brothers had out one time. Uh, song, uh, Last One uh, on My Mind. Last Thing on My Mind? Yeah. Okay. I, and I said, that's the one we need to start on. And we learned that that night by memory to where we sang it without putting any uh, lyrics on on the on a cardboard or anything and uh, boy it uh, it made all the difference in the world I said because that way it will kind of soften the blow of your little uh, voice is so high and you talking so fast they can't understand you Dolly and I know you didn't realize how fast you were talking but it was like and you're done you know? <laughs> and uh, did she ever slow down oh well, yeah she did uh, I guess she was just excited at the She was the so beginning. excited, and she didn't realize she was talking real fast, you know. And uh, uh, the next day, it was a completely different picture. And uh, when I introduced her, when she came on the stage, and there was just a different person there, sound like, to me. She was much more civilized. <laughs> <laughs> she uh, she had, uh, didn't, didn't talk near as fast. And uh, we sung that duet, and it was so good, man. I, I just thought it was was a knockout. And they, You're amazing. You know that? And, the man who civilized Dolly Parton. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, uh, the, uh, but, you know, what, what was so amazing was the fact we, they wanted to encore us on that first song we had sang. Well, I knew we just had one more to do, and, and uh, 
I said, oh, we're going to do something else here. And uh, so we done the second song. And boy, they, they still just tore the house you down. Learned, you learned two songs yeah. for, the, for the piece. Yeah. Was the other one put it off until tomorrow? Uh, the song she wrote with, for, I Bill, believe it was, for Bill Phillips? Right. I'm not positive, but I think it was. And uh, yeah, her and Bill Phillips had that song out. Right. And I, I did Bill's part. And uh, boy, she was so happy when we, uh, and uh, then she sang her songs that she had uh, rehearsed for the show. And uh, they, they just accepted her great then. There never was another problem with that. That's great. Yes. So you, you reconciled the problem. It really did, yes. And uh, it, was, it, it, it was a problem with her, or it, it was heartbreaking for her the first night. She just cried as, uh, but one of the things I kept us rehearsing a lot was, it's really important we learn these two songs that a lot more important than your crying is. <laughs> So just hush and let's, let's <laughs> learn these songs. And she was great about working on them, too. Boy, she worked her heart out. And Porter, uh, let's do a little merchandising here. All right. What do, you, what do you have in your hand? This is a new album of mine. And uh, it's uh, a place they can get it. It's, uh, it's Time Life album uh, from the Grand Ole Opry. These are songs I did on the Opry several years ago. It's called Legends of the Grand Ole Opry. You can only get it at Walmart. And it's uh, Time Life Legends, it's called. And uh, get it at Walmart store. Okay. For 90 days. Yeah, 90 days. Okay, there, there it is. That's what we're selling. Yeah. The uh, recordings were made live of the Opry beginning in 1963. Right. Right? Yeah. 1963 to 1967. Yep, that's it. Okay. And thank you for letting me announce that. And, uh, We'll sell a few of them, okay. hopefully. Let's talk about something else that you really are proud of. Oh, and yeah. That's the, the new album produced by Marty Stewart. Yes, buddy. It's called Wagon Master. Tell me about it. That's one of the best albums, Ralph. I'm more proud of that than anything I've ever done. And as far as the albums go, I've never made a better album than this. And M Marty, God love the man. He, bless his heart, he just... He worked his heart out for this project, and I'm so proud of it. It's, uh, it's my best work that I've done on anything. Now, Porter, that's hard to believe. It is. I though. mean, you have, you've been singing for a long time. Yeah. But uh -oh. honestly, that's the, I can say that's the best work I've ever done in my whole career. Marty Stewart called you one day and said, let's make a record? Well, yeah, after we had talked several times about it, we had uh, talked about it for about a year and a half, almost two years. And as you know, I got uh, sick with an aneurysm, and I had to have surgery done on that. Uh, during the process of us talking about doing the album, that laid me up for about five months. And, uh, of course, he and I kept in contact with each other, while I was in the hospital. First thing when I went home, why, he said, I want us to get together as soon as you feel like it, as soon as you're able to sing a little. He said, uh, and we'll, we'll get you to singing better. And uh, we did. He, we'd uh, work with just he and I and a couple of guitars. And uh, we sat on, uh, I had a couple of stools down my, at home in my basement, and we just, we'd sit there and pick for a little bit till I'd start getting tired, and then I'd tell him, and we'd, we'd stop, and, and I'd go rest. Well, it's called Wagon Master, and I've heard it, and I recommend it to you, my friends. Porter says it's his best work. It really is. It honestly is. You wouldn't lie to me, would you, Porter? No, I would not, <laughs> no. And you've heard some good records of mine. Yes, I have. You know, you used to play I Thought I Heard You Call My Name on the radio, buddy, and uh, uh, that's a great song, too. But Porter, the, you've, you've had a great career, and you've made some great records. Well, thank you. Let me take a little break here. We're talking to Porter Wagner. We'll be right back.
One of my favorite Porter Wagoner stories occurred a long time ago in a cornfield, I guess, <laughs> near West Plains, Missouri. And you were a little younger, Porter. Yeah. But, but you had a dream. That was when I was dreaming of coming to the Grand Ole Opry, Ralph, and the, the true story. I was uh, plowing corn, busting the middles out of corn field we had. And it was in July, and uh, boy, it was hot. And uh, I mean, the dust was boiling out there. And I was all that dust and everything. I wasn't seeing, seeing a lot. I was just, but I was dreaming of uh, going to the Grand Ole Opry. And I was- How old were you? I think I was probably 13. Okay. Yeah. And uh, uh, I would introduce my guest, whoever I was using at that time, I'd say I, I'd introduce Roy Acuff, and, and I'd have, come on out, Roy, good to have you on the show today, and then I'd talk for him a while and say, well, Porter, I'm so glad to be here with you. I've been <laughs> looking forward to coming up here to West Plains, and, and I was pretending like he was right there with me. And, and uh, then I'd sing a little of the Wabash Cannonball. You know, I'm the great Atlantic Ocean to the wide Pacific shore. <laughs> and I'd sing a little more of the song and, uh, and thank him for being there. And anyway, I went up to the end of the row and it kind of shocked me. I didn't think there's anybody in that area at all. You know, I was just uh, in my own world, I guess. And, and this boy I went to school with, Kenneth Chapin, was standing out the end of the row, and I, I seen him, and he, he said, who's you talking to coming down through there? <laughs> and I didn't want to tell him I was talking to myself, and I said, well, I was talking to uh, some people at the Grand Ole Opry. That, uh, I, I was playing like I was on the Grand Ole Opry. He said, Grand Ole Opry, you're as near the Grand Ole Opry as you'll ever be, probably. He said, you'll be looking these mules in the rear end when you're 75. <laughs> and I had a lot of fun letting him know when on my 75th birthday I called him. Did you? Yes. <laughs> and uh, I got in touch with him and uh, told him I was, wasn't was looking at them mules no more. And Porter, I want to congratulate you because you finished 50 years at the Opry. Oh, I did, just a few weeks ago. What a wonderful night. They they threw a great, great party for me, Ralph. They, uh, they uh, had uh, friends of mine came there. My sister came down from West Plains and uh, flew down an airplane uh, with John L. Morris, brought her down. And uh, uh, just uh, my friends and my old band, the Wagon Masters uh, that made the uh, television shows with me and everything, they were all there. And it was a wonderful night. How many Wagon Masters are left? They was, uh, let's see, I believe there was, uh, I think there was five of them, five or six of them. Uh, George McCormick, Little Jack, Little, and Don the, Warden, and Don Warden, uh, Buck Crent. They all were there, and uh, I believe that's that's it. How many, how many did I say? Four, five. Well, I'll accept that. I think that's so it was a big night for you. It was, oh yeah, it was. Dollar great. show up? Yeah, yes. And uh, it was a very special night for me. And Norma Jean? Uh, Norma Jean, no, she was uh, Branson. Okay. And she was working that night and she couldn't come. I invited her, and uh, but it was a wonderful night and I got pictures of everybody. Well, you're, you're kicking up a lot of dust all over yeah. the country. Yesterday in the Nashville, Tennessee, in our home paper here, uh, you're, there you are on the front page, and then inside they have a special section, a life section, and it says, Wagon Master takes unusual trip. Porter Wagner bypasses Music Row with a new album that taps his peculiar gifts. <laughs> <laughs> Did you know you had a peculiar gift? <laughs> <laughs> no. uh, but I, I really appreciate all the press that I've gotten in the last few weeks have been, been tremendous. And uh, the Nashville, Tennessee has always been a great paper to me. They've been very good to me. You, you told me that, that that big picture and that big article was a surprise. It was, yeah. It was a surprise. They didn't, me. nobody told you? They no. were going to do that? Uh-uh. No, it didn't. Wow. 
And, uh, but I've had a lot of those nice surprises here lately. You know, I told Porter earlier, when, before the cameras were rolling, when you're interviewing somebody who's done as many things as he has, it's hard to pick and choose what to talk about. I went through your, the book that came out in 1992, and I don't, I don't think this is available now, is it? I don't believe it is, Ralph. I don't think so. But there's an interesting story in there about your teaching Mel Tillis to talk on stage. I did. Tell me that story. Well, Mel started to uh, work for me. He wanted to be on the television show. And so I hired him uh, to uh, be on the show for at least a year. And he did. And uh, while he was uh, on the show, we started working concerts together. And uh, one night, I, I said, Mel, you know what? You have never talked on the stage much because you stutter. And that's uh, you using that as a, as a crutch when you ought to be using it to your advantage. And he said, well, what do you mean? I said, you ought to talk to people and let them know you can talk. And if you stutter, they won't care. Just go ahead and stutter where you want to, and then they'll love you for it, man. So he went out that night, and he did, and he started to talk, and he's, you know, he uh, done like that a few times, and then he just started to talk, and he said, uh, well, uh, Porter told me to come out here and say something, and said, I don't know what to say, except I'm glad to be with you all, and, and so forth, and he got hung up again there. Well, people just, they loved it, you know, and, and he went on, and then he sung another song, and uh, when he got done, uh, and time for him to come off, he they just wouldn't let him come off the stage. <laughs> And I said, well, now, the first thing you've got to learn to do is get off when it's time. <laughs> and, of course, I was only kidding him because he was wonderful, and the people just, it made him such a different act. And I told him, I said, didn't you enjoy that? He said, yes, I did. He said, I enjoyed it. I said, well, that's going to be a part of your act. Uh, just do that from now on, man. When you go on the stage, people will love you, man, and they'll talk about you. And, and they, they did. They did. That was actually the first time that he'd done it on stage. Porter, a long time ago, I know, I know you started in a butcher shop singing yep. at what, Vaughn's Meat Market? Yep. West Plains? Right. And uh, KWPM, right? That's exactly right. But I don't know where to put Smiley Burnett in your story. Well... First of all, let me explain. Smiley Burnett was Gene Autry's sidekick. Yes. And you worked with him. Oh, yeah. And I got the job there in West Plains. He was playing theaters. And uh, this uh, man that owned the theaters in West Plains had three theaters, three theaters there. But he had some in other towns, too. And uh, he told, uh, told him that he'd like for him to work his theater chain. And he said he would, and he asked, asked me if I'd like to go on the road with him. And I said, yeah. And he said, and uh, to play guitar with him. And I didn't know much about, you know, playing the guitar uh, because I just played for myself when I was singing on the radio. And uh, he said, uh, well, you don't have to know but three chords, and the things I play will just be all simple, and which they were. And... Uh, he said, you don't have to worry about taking a bunch of clothes and stuff on the road because I do laundry every night. And he <laughs> said, we'll, we'll do the laundry when nighttime comes and we hang them up and they're dry and ready again in the morning. And uh, so forth. And more, I learned one, a lot from the man. You took one, one, one suit or whatever? Yeah, just take one suit of clothes with you. <laughs> and, of course, I took two. And, uh, but he, he was so smart about traveling, he said, taking a bunch of clothes is crazy on the road. He said, just take enough for you to wear where you'll have something to wear, and that's all you need, ever. And he said, uh, uh, he, I said, I'll do the cooking. He said, I'll cook our meals for us. It won't cost you a thing for food. I'll have the food. Okay, was he, what, was he done at this time with the Gene Autry part of his life? No, no, he still was uh, doing movies with Gene. Did, did you get to meet Gene? Yes, I did, yeah. And uh, 
I asked him a lot about Gene, and he told me some stories about how he come to write songs for Gene Autry. I asked him, I knew he had written uh, Riding Down the Canyon. Right. To watch the sun go down. And uh, he said, uh, well, Gene told me if I got my job by writing that song. And I said, well, what do you mean? And he said, well, he told me one night, he said, if you write me a song about this, uh, this uh, canyon here, if I like it, I'll give you a job. And, well, that's uh, a lot of pressure. Yeah, and he said, uh, I wrote Riding Down the Canyon that night and sung it for him the next morning. He said, you've got the job. It became a big hit for Gene Autry. Oh, it did, absolutely. And uh, he said, that's just exactly how it happened. And uh, how long did you work for him? Uh, I worked about two weeks. And then back to the butcher shop? Yeah, yep. Let's see, Porter, uh, in West Plains, then or up at Springfield, up, up the road, you went to work for KWTO. Yeah, yeah. Were you on the Ozark Jubilee? Yes, I was there when the Ozark Jubilee started. I, w I made a lot of trips to Nashville with me, Cy Simon. Let me ask you a question. All right. Do you have any money on you? Yeah. Did you walk in here with money? Not much. Because in your book, it says that you, uh, you, made, uh, you noticed that Red Foley never carried money. And because Red Foley didn't carry money, you made it, make it a habit not to carry any money. Well. Is that true? <laughs> no, that's not true, really. Because I was going to ask for a little loan while you were here. <laughs> I, was, I bet I might have ought to scratch up a few dollars for you. Well, I appreciate that. Well, but, but that came out of your book. Oh, did it? Yes, well, it did. I don't know where you got that story at. The, we're going to go to a break here, but and after this break, we're going to let you folks at home call and talk to Porter Wagner at 1-866-547-9696, right after this. friend T. Tommy Cotrer used to call him Slick Nickel. Porter <laughs> Wagon is our guest and we're going to go to the phones now and I see that we have John down in Florida, Porter. So John, how are you? I'm fine, Ralph. Uh, congratulations on uh, this program. I really enjoy it. Thank uh, you. And hello, Porter. It's good to see you on TV again, buddy. Well, thank you very much. It's great to be here with my friend Ralph. Well, I got a question, uh, Porter. Did you ever record in... Uh, Studio B in, in Nashville, and if so, describe a session for me. Were the Anita Kerr singers there? Did you use the Wagon Masters? Did Chet produce it? What, what was it like? Well, it was, uh, Chet did produce some things for me on the, uh, in the Studio B. However, Chet never did record a hit for me, and uh, so uh, one year he was going to England, and he told me, he said, I want you to pick some songs you'd like to record and uh, the musicians, you'd like to play on them. And while I'm gone, get in Studio B and do it. And he said that uh, we'll see how it works out. If it works out good, we might just have you do that from now on down the road. So when he went to England with, uh, with uh, Jim, uh, Jim Reeves, Reeves, Jim Reeves, why, uh, I did that. And I had three hits out of the uh, album I cut. One of them was uh, Misery Loves Company, the other one was uh, Old Love Letters, and the other one was Sugarfoot Rag. Okay, John. Sure, sing with What? Well, I didn't catch the last remark. I, he mentioned the Anita Kerr singers. Did you use them? Yeah, I did for a little while, and uh, they wasn't on this particular project, though. Okay. Let's go to New York somewhere. Bob, where are you? I'm in upstate New York, just outside of Cortland. All right. What's uh, what's on your mind? Well, I'd like to uh, welcome you back to the air. Thank you. Um, I, I met you at uh, the Nashville Now Show years ago. Well, thank and you. And also, um, I got to work with Porter and met him a couple other times at Opryland, and I worked with him at uh, the Cortland Country Music Park 
years ago, and I just want to say that he was a very nice, a pure country gentleman, and I really appreciate what he's done for country music over the last 50 or so years. Bob, you got a question? No, I just wanted to uh, to wish him health and, and good luck, and uh, again, I wanted to say he was uh, such a gentleman to me and my wife, and we really appreciate him in country music. We sure do. Bob, thank you very much. Okay, I want to mention along the way that uh, at the Porter Wagner website. All right. What is it? Uh, it's uh, gospel, a lot of gospel records on www.porterwagner.com. Yeah, and you have uh, a gospel album, Gospel 2000? Yes. 2007, I'm sorry. Yeah. And then you have uh, Porter Wagner, 20 all-time greatest hits. Yep. Are these re-recorded? Re uh, yes. Okay. And uh, that is my newest gospel album, that other one is. Okay. And uh, they can get everything back from 1964 up to... Uh, on, the, on the Greatest Hits album? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Let's go to Texas. Janice is there, I think. Yes. Janice, say, say hi to us. Hi there. How are y'all doing? Fine. I was basically wanting to call and let Ralph know how much we're enjoying this program. And I want Porter to know that we've loved him for years and years and years. He's one of my favorites. And he was coming to the Weatherford Opry down here about five years ago, and we had our tickets and was all excited about it. And he got sick and wasn't able to make it. And I'm hoping that one day I get to see him in person and get a picture with him. You said all that without taking a breath. <laughs> well, she said, she said to be fast. I didn't have a question, but I thought of one uh, while I was waiting. But uh, since uh, all these new sh these shows have come back on RFD TV, all the old Porter Wagner shows, we were watching George Jones, and he had two little boys with him, and Porter said they were George's little sons. And they had a last name that was different than his, and I was wondering who those, those little boys were. You know, I wish I could remember their names, and I can't. That was a long time ago. Yeah, it was. That, uh, and they weren't George's sons, though. Uh, I don't think he had anything to do with uh, their being born on this earth. <laughs> I'm pretty sure he didn't. <laughs> okay. Uh, but I do remember the ones she's talking about, but I don't remember their names. Yes. Well, I just want you to know that we really love you, and you just keep it going, because we're all for you. Well, thank you, honey, so much for calling. Thank you, Janice. There's a, there's a guy down in Fort Worth who's a, he plays a legendary country music on the radio on Sunday. Uh, Joe. And uh, Joe Belinsky. I, I hope Joe's watching. Let's go to Mississippi now. M-I-S-S-I-S-S-I-P-P-I. Murtis. Hi, Ralph. Hi, Porter. Uh, Porter, I just wanted to ask you about Mac McGahey, your yes. little dancing fiddle player. Yes, ma'am. Can you tell me something about him? I've not seen or heard or anything in a long, long time. Mac died about two years ago. Oh, honey. I'm so sorry. Well, I am too, I sweetheart. really am, Porter. He, uh, he was, Mac was, uh, he had been sick for a long time. God bless his little heart. And uh, he was a wonderful guy. Yes, he was. And uh, I know he's in heaven. I, I feel that way too, Porter. And and let me tell you, uh, I, it's good to see you, and I do love your recitation. Well, thank your you. Your songs are so special, and you did a great job with Buck Trent now. <laughs> thank he's you so much. He's got the best show in Branson. Well, I think he has too. He's uh, a, he really has. He's a very special man, and... Uh, Thank you so much for asking about Matt. Well, I've, I've, I've just wondered about him, and thank you so much for being who you are and giving us all that good country music for all this long time. I appreciate you, Porter. Thank you. And honey. love you too, Ralph. Thank you. Okay. Ralph, this is, this is really fun. <laughs> this is great. These people love you, Porter. They, they do, buddy. That's, uh, that's just amazing uh, to people... Uh, they still love you and I both, too, and I'm so proud I got to be on your show with you, too. Well, I'm tickled to death. Let's go to Ohio. Up in the Buckeye State, there is Mike, I believe. Mike, hi. Hi, how are you, Ralph? Fine, thank you. I just want to tell Porter what a fine Southern gentleman he is, how much I enjoyed him watching him through the years. I want to know, he talked about Mac McGahey being gone. How about Speck Rhodes? Is he still around? 
No, Speck, Speck passed away two and a half years ago, and he lived a long life. Speck, I believe, was 80, I'm not sure, 80-something, and uh, he was a wonderful man. He spent a lot of years with uh, me and the wagon masters, and every one of them was a joyful time. Okay, Mike? Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Did, did they ever play tricks on him? and hot wire that telephone. Oh, yes, they did. And say things to him <laughs> while you were, while the tape was rolling. Oh, yeah, they would. I had heard that. Yeah, they did. <laughs> and I, they, it was really funny because he would try to get out of it. You know, he said, somebody's on this phone. <laughs> <laughs> He'd be talking to Sadie. His, yeah, his, right. And they just, His imaginary sweetheart. Uh, yes, he would. He was and a wonderful what man. What they do is say, get back. <laughs> They used to say a lot of things to him, didn't oh, they? Oh, yeah, they would, yeah. <laughs> Down in the state of Georgia, we find Jesse. Jesse, good evening. Good evening. What's on your mind? Well, I just first wanted to tell Porter that I have been in love with him since the first time I saw him walk across the stage. Wow. All right. And uh, that's been a few wow. years ago. <laughs> uh, and, my well, husband and I have a little country band, and our oldest son and his wife is the other half, and we do a lot of Porter songs, and we're unable to find his older recordings down here. And I wondered if where we would go to find his, his older albums. Well, good, good, good question. Yeah, that is a good question. And I, I tell you, the place that has more records of mine than anyone in Nashville is the King Record Company, King Gusto. And uh, they will fix you up with a catalog, I'm sure, of what all they have of mine. Can, can they find that address at your website? I, well, the website uh, goes into their place, too. Okay. Uh, just uh, porterwagner.com, www.porterwagner.com. Do you have a computer? Oh, yes. Okay. And uh, just call that www. Uh, period. Now that you don't say period, it's a dot. <laughs> right, dot com. <laughs> Jesse, I, I appreciate your call, honey. Well, we just, we love you so much. We do a lot of your, a lot of your duets with, that you did with Dolly. Well, thank you, honey. And so, if I, so, thank you so much. And, uh, I have a new duet partner that we have a record out now that's a real good duet. Pam Gadd is her name. And they'll send you a list of things that they have available of her and I. And uh, she's good, too. All right. That was Jesse in Georgia. That's our last call of the evening. And we'll return with uh, part four of our visit with Porter Wagner right after this. enough on these cards that we could talk for a week. How did you happen to bring James Brown, the <laughs> godfather of a soul, to the Grand Ole Opry? You must have upset some people. Well, it did for a little <laughs> while till they found out what it was all about and found out really how good he was. But he was a wonderful entertainer, Ralph. I went to see him one time when I was in uh, at the Terrace Ballroom in uh, right across from New York City on uh, the New Jersey side. And uh, I was there on a Saturday night. Him and a big uh, bunch of his buddies like uh, Fats Domino and uh, oh, Little Richard and uh, a bunch of them was uh, appearing there. And I went mainly to see James, but uh, it was so uh, uh, a bunch of them was there with him and I really enjoyed all the show. But he was such an entertainer. And uh, I mean, he did, it sounded like a, a storm hit that building when he come on the stage. And uh, I went backstage after the show and got acquainted with him and uh, told him, I said, I'd, I'd love to have you sometime come visit me at the Grand Ole Opry. He said, just call me and I'll be there. And uh, this was several years I after know. that, but 
he remembered that too and he said uh, I'll be glad to come whenever you want me to what did he sing on the Opry well did he do his regular material oh yeah after he had done three Hank Williams songs really I told him that uh, be best I said if you'd sang three Hank Williams songs uh, I said they'll love you a lot more than they would if you just go out and open with uh, with songs like get up off that thing and <laughs> and uh, uh, some of your material it's not that they're not great but they ain't you know they're not used to them and if you would kind of uh, sever the blow a little by <laughs> singing three <laughs> of Hank Williams songs and uh, why well, he said yeah Said I know a lot of his songs. Did Roy Acuff ever forgive you? Uh, yeah, <laughs> he did. But uh, he uh, he did. Roy just didn't understand why I was doing it. Why did you do it? Well, because I wanted to create some excitement at the Grand Ole Opry, instead of it just being another week when Old Man Rivers I'm coming on by <laughs> one more time. And I wanted it to have a lot of people come into town to see this excitement that's going to be there that night. Now, did I assume you discussed this with Opry management? I did, and I, I had a little problem of getting them to understand really what I was going for. But I, I told Bud Wendell, who was the head man there at that time, he and Hal Durham, I told both of them, I said, uh, what will happen here is you'll have press people from all over the world come here because this is something unusual and this man it'll absolutely he'll knock these people out of their seats he's so good uh, did all of that happen yeah he did really did you, get, did you get the press that you were looking for yes we got uh, press from all over the world they was there i forget how many foreign countries was uh uh there that night because we had a big party after we the opera was over at the at the hotel and uh James and I went over to the hotel after the opera was over, and he was really thrilled with all the press people that was there and the pictures they took. And, and uh, because it had all smoothed out then, and then it was such a great idea to have him on the opera, everybody wanted to take credit for it then. <laughs> Because yeah. it was a wonderful thing you happened. You mean somebody else took credit for that? No, no, no. They, <laughs> uh, but they, they, just, they knew that it was my idea and, uh, and that it was something that I, I took a lot of pride in doing. And uh, James called me the, the afternoon. Now he said, what are you going to wear tonight? I said, probably the brightest suit I've got, buddy. I want to be, be nice and bright. He said, I want us to look like two peas in a pod. <laughs> <laughs> and... Uh, he really did. He just, uh, boy, he was a knockout on stage. What color was his suit? He, uh, we both had on, I think, uh, a kind of a purple, lavender purple type thing. And uh, it, it really looked good, and I, I just thought it was great. Porter, we haven't talked about your rhinestones tonight. How many rhinestone suits do you own? Well, I probably, I don't really know now. Uh, Ralph, I probably have. I imagine 40 or 50, I guess, probably all total. And uh, I'm very proud of that because that's been a big part of my career. And uh, just like the one I've got on, I, no, I didn't dress down for tonight. This is one of my brightest. Ones. I think it's beautiful. Well, thank you. It doesn't have the high inside, though. No, uh, this, uh, because I, this is one of the newer ones. And uh, tell these people why you started opening the coat. Well, I did, a good reason. because it had the uh, inside of it, it had high. <laughs> well, I'm thinking, I'm thinking about the big belt buckle. Well, the, uh, I had a, uh, the belt buckle said high, and one said bye. <laughs> <laughs> I never did show it that much, but uh, uh, the, the belt buckle is one of the, the Wild Turkey Federation. I do a show for them almost every year. And Rob Keck and Johnny Morris of uh, uh, Bass Pro Shops, they all made, they had this belt buckle made for me. How much time have we got, Jeremiah? I was going to ask you about the time you wore the girdle. You oh, remember that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The, in the parade? Yeah. <laughs> it was cold, wasn't it? Oh, as cold as could be, man. I, I was riding horseback, too. 
And I got off my horse. I wanted to go in and go to the bathroom before I got on the horse to ride uh, through the whole parade, which lasted about two hours. And uh, <laughs> I went in, and I was at the back, in the back entrance to Tootsie's Orchid Lounge. And this old boy was standing in there, and he was about half, looked like he's about, no, he's more than half drunk. He's pretty drunk. And I went in and started to try to get out of this girdle to go to the men's room. And he, he asked me, he said, where did you get that suit at? I said, I got this out of Mr. Nudie's. He said, yeah, that's where I get my clothes at, too. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, he didn't know who I was talking about. Uh, but that's that's was what that, he, was that the Christmas parade? Yeah, it was, and uh, it was. Uh, I just thought it'd be good for me to wear that because it helped keep me warm during the <laughs> during the thing. But it's boy, it's awful hard to go to the bathroom with. Can you can you see him <laughs> telling somebody that story? Oh yeah, I never <laughs> believed that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that, it was wild, man. He he was a looker, Porter. We're, we've got to wrap this up. I want to thank you for coming. And it's, Buddy, these people, I think, have made you well aware that they're so proud of you and still love you. Well, Ralph, I'm so thankful that God has uh, blessed me with uh, keeping my, me alive through some of the surgery I had, through the aneurysm and so forth. When's your birthday? Uh, 12th of August. You'll be? 80. I'll be 80. And I'm very proud of it, Ralph. I'm, uh, God has really blessed me with having a wonderful, marvelous career and giving me friends like you and uh, making my, my uh, stand at the Grand Ole Opry a wonderful experience. We have to sign off tonight, thankful. buddy. Thank you. Will you come back sometime? Or any time you want me to. Next week, Brenda Lee will be here, my friends. Ralph Emery live from Nashville. Good night.